Now, the biggest problem with how I'm approaching this today is that um, whatever slides we don't get through today uh, will be um, referred to another week. And um, what am I blithering on about? We've, we've started off on the archaeology of archaeological excavations throughout Britain and further afield. Uh, and one of the, one of the ones I, I wanted to look at first was actually Binchester, which was the Roman site at Durham. There you go, voila. Um, however, beautifully uh, beautiful walls in an extremely um, fine state of preservation. Um, and that's where I was going to go today. But I, I've deferred that for next week. The lecture I wanted to avoid today was actually doing uh, the Nessa Bodga. Um, but I decided to go ahead with it anyway. So we, we're going to be looking at the Nessa Bodga. Um, and the reason why I want to start at the Nessa Bodga is I get so excited about it um, that the hour and a half will just pass just like that. You won't even know you're here. And I'll have forgotten to take the money. So we will have a break. So... Um, we will start off where we're meant to begin uh, with a little bit of a map. Now, what usually happens in life is that this um, interjecture, Ellen puts her hand up and says, where is this site? Okay, yeah, so... I I so it's very fuzzy, I can't read any of that. <laughs> <laughs> There's always one, isn't there? There you go, is now it, you can read it. Is it Australia? You can. Oh, what do you mean you can't? The United Kingdom, it says. I know, I can see the United <laughs> Kingdom, I can't see anything else. It's right in the there! Ah. Yeah. Do you know what? That lady's been with me, she's walked me three times, funny. and she still doesn't know where it is, right? Funny enough, I do. Right, Nessa Brodka, um, and the Nessa Brodka itself, the archaeology of the Nessa Brodka, um, is something that um, I've got sort of direct experience with because it was it was my university that that's excavated it, has been excavated, and will excavate it for a very very long time. Um, and he, the 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 guy who um, <coughs> directs the excavations at the site, um, Kathy upset him, um, Doctor Nick Card, didn't you? Yes, she did. Uh, because she tramps across his land without his permission, but there's a story associated with that which we will come on to. So, the nest of Brodger, the archaeology there, is beyond the fascinating and links us in with so many things that, that we have actually discussed um, over the past few years. And I even got a technical problem before it even started. So, I need to just um, remind Dennis of his place in life. <coughs> then then he said to me, I, he said, when, when he came in earlier on, he said, um, I said, Dennis, go and get a seat. He said, don't tell me what to do. So I really upset him. <laughs> it wasn't quite like that. We <laughs> uh, know to believe. We, we know to believe. You, you know to believe in all. So, so I'm just making sure that I can, that these are going to be in sequence. Um, we do believe that we can go... Oh, there we go. It's working. Now, an archaeologist looking up at the sky, predicting whether it's going to rain or not. Now, that's very interesting, because um, uh, time and memorial, we've been to Orkney, and it's been raining, but the archaeology takes away the rain. Um, oh, okay, don't labour the point, okay? Um... And one thing that I always remember, I've been to Orkney, I can't remember five or six times or whatever, but I've been to Orkney five or six times since 2012. Um, and every time I've gone to the Nessa Bodga, it's always been covered up with plastic sheeting. I've never actually uh, seen the excavations as they're being undertaken. And, um, and, and um, unknown, unbeknown to Michelle, and nobody to tell Michelle this, I, I had the opportunity as part of one of my units, as, as my master's degree a year or so ago, to actually excavate at the uh, Nessa Bronca for a whole week. And I turned down that opportunity. Um, and Michelle could have joined me on it as well. <laughs> I, 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 I'm so pleased that she doesn't know that. Um, but underneath the, that top, top polling, and the images that we're going to see today, um, for me, um, being involved in archaeology for so many years, um, is, is, is a fascinate, fascinating area. Um, 
and it will be a site that's going to be excavated for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. There's just so much to excavate there. And when they've done the stuff on the land, they can do the stuff in the water around the outside as well. They've excavated one seventh of the site at the Nessa Brodka, and they started in 2003. And they haven't exactly gone down a great deal of depth either at that one locality. So if you times that with the amount of time, it might take a good 60 to 70 years to really get a good picture of what's going on there. But then, then again, um, when we look at the likes of Andronicus, who excavated at Vagina in Macedon, uh, we look at the Burley family who are excavating at Vinvalanda, when an archaeologist gets their teeth into a site, they never, ever let it go. Uh, just, just like your love for the uh, Romans, Alan, can I just uh, interject you? When did you actually start to have a love for the Romans? Early. Early, good. Early, early. I mean, fairly early. Early, early. 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 Yeah, early. Okay. Um, so another, another little bit of the story here. The, the archaeologist who excavates this site sort of lives up by here, up on the hill. Um, and one day I dropped off um, Kathy um, and Bill to go and have a look at the Ring of Brechen. Um, we had permission from another archaeologist who hadn't notified the other archaeologist whose land it was on that we were visiting. Um, so Kathy and Bill had a bit of a mouthful when they went over to see it. Um, and I had hassle for it afterwards. Um, that archaeologist um, owns this land. He, he, he bought, strangely enough, he seemed to buy the house and within a short period of time he made this amazing discovery at the Ness. I thought it was his parents. Very strange, it. yes. Oh. Well, he owns it now, it's his house. Yeah, but it was his parents before. Oh, don't labour the point. I'm trying to paint the picture here. You've really oh. sp thrown He's a spot. a lovely sheet, though. Mm. It's, it's really gone downhill, hasn't it? It's just gone. It's, it's float. But the fact of the matter is, this this mm. this archaeologist Nick Card has got an archaeological site to excavate for the for the rest of time. His family can excavate generation after generation. And what you're seeing here um, is a large lake on the right hand side, and there's another large lake on the left hand side. It's the Ness, so a spit of land. Three locks, but strictly speaking, they're not lakes. They are sea locks today. See, you're, you're jumping into... Just because you've been to the site, you're jumping in too soon. Um, so, the, the, uh, back in the time, five, six thousand years ago, um, the areas of water here were, were basically small pools in comparison with the sea locks as you see them today. They would have been fresh water. Um, and the spit of land itself, going all the way over to the rings of Stennis, up by here, so he lives up by here, uh, up by here, um, are the rings of Bro Brodga. So you've got the rings of Brodga, uh, the, rings, uh, the ring of Stennis, and you've got this big archaeological site in the middle. 2.5 hectares of pure archaeology, 100% unadulterated archaeology. The type of things a, a normal archaeologist would die for, as long as you're interested in prehistory. Alan's just about to leave because I don't mention the Romans at all today. Um, you, you see the excavations here, and, and it's... They, they are opening new areas as well, and, and there's an, a, a season of about two months that they're excavating at the site. The University of the Highlands and Ireland are excavating. <coughs> um, archaeologists come over from the States, other universities excavate. It's the place to be, and they're making new discoveries every year. Um, from the likes of... Um, the, this is one amazing discovery. They, they, they were excavating in one of the buildings. And up, up until this point, they, they didn't know what they were putting on the roofs of the buildings on Orkney. They, 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 they thought that they were placing reeds, turfs, um, woods, hides, all sorts of different things. You know, when, when we go to Scarra Bray, it's got descriptions of what they may have put on the roofs. Nobody for one moment thought that they could have had timber that supported big slabs of stone on the roofs, big tiles of stone on the roofs. No, nobody could have dreamt about it. One day they were excavating a building and there was all these huge slabs that, that collapsed into the building, big, big slabs um, with um, dowels in the, with, with holes in them. And then they realised that this was actually the roof that had collapsed inwards. Um, and the interesting thing about that is they must have been supported by very large um, sections of timber. Old, old maybe maybe old trees or new trees, but the fact of the matter is, 5,000 years ago, they still had large quantities of trees on Orkney, if that's anything to go by. Therefore, 
lots of what I have been saying about Orkney, you know, was completely deforested by about five, de-wooded and deforested by about 5,000 years ago, may actually be wrong, because there's only way, there's only one way they could have had spans of timber uh, that's, that spanned areas, uh, the width, and, and longer than the width of this room, um, there's only one way they could have spanned it if they actually had the timber growing on the island. So that, that's one, in, that, that's one um, areas of the revolution that the Ring of Broad Girl has actually um, given us. Um, and the, another side, they've actually got painted stone walls from 5,000 years ago. Um, they, they, they've, got, they've got the preservation of these buildings that, that is absolutely beautiful. Um, and so many other things. And what, the way I actually do this today is by taking a little plan and look at a building, a little bit of a description, coming back to the plan, little building, the description. And it's so well organised today. Um, so let, let's carry on. There you go. Uh, move over, darling. And what, what's the thing is lot, lots, of, um, lots of igneous um, stone is actually ending up um, on mainland Orkney. Um, lot, lots of stone around the landscape. Um, is sandstone, so some of the stones need to be brought in from Scotland or some of the outer islands of Orkney. But the main thing is that we do find wonderful polished axes, wonderful, beautifully polished axes. These polished ax axes haven't been touched or seen for 5,000 years. Um, and one of, one of the areas of the archaeological excavation techniques is that every single stone found at the nest has to be examined because they, they found stones at the nest. And, if, and then you turn them up and you think, oh my God, there's a bit of carving on that. Or you turn the, the stone around and there's a bit of so soil with a bone embedded into it and um, encrusted into the rock. So you've got to look at every single detail. Every single stone there ha has, has, an, has a question and, an, and sometimes an answer to what's going on at the nurse. Um, one, one thing that they're, they're, they're really sort of starting to get a grip with is, is the early forms of pottery. One thing that I've said about the earliest forms of pottery is that if you've got pottery that's, that's just made out of clay and just thrown out into the sun and dried, uh, or just put above a fire for, for an hour or so, when water gets to it, it just goes back to clay. Um, and they're experimenting with the temperatures required um, from the artifacts that they're seeing at the mess um, to how we look at pottery. Um, and they do find some, um, small amounts of pottery at, at the nest, but not as much as there could be, simply because lots of the pottery was fired at a very low temperature. For example, if you fire a potter about 400 degrees C, it's likely that if you get enough moisture into it, it'll go back to clay. You need to get about six, 700 years before it actually gets to proper earthenware, proper ceramic pottery. Um, and and they stand to use the nest as well as, a, as more of an experimental site as well. Pottery itself, um, small fragments of pottery that have actually come out from the site, they, they've actually found that the pottery was painted. So after it had been baked um, in a fire or outside in an open clamp kiln at a very low temperature or whatever, we're not doing pottery today, uh, they, they've, they've actually, they've actually, it's dried and they've actually painted on an ochre. Um, and you, you, you get faint traces of ochre on pottery. So it, it's, it's like the after case of producing pottery and then just painting on it. So this is what we're seeing. Small little nuggets of information. That's, uh, that's Nick Card. Um, I recognise his green top, which he wears everywhere. He cornered me in the university one day and said, you're that tour guide. And I said, no, I'm actually an archaeologist. And he backed off. It's your fault, Cathy. <coughs> I had so much hassle because of that. Is this going to happen every year, then? <laughs> 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 oh God! I, you know, I, 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 you're, you know, you're allowed to. It, it was a public footpath for God's sake. Uh, anyway, so one one thing that we've got, we've got Nick Card with his with his top on, and uh, he's looking at a trench. And what you can't see is a linear wall there, which we will see. The linear wall. And as he's looking at geophys um, over, over part of the nest, because you, you can get an idea of the scale. Uh, that's 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 the um, that's the one side of the lock, and that's the the, the other lock on this side. And that's the nest. That the, the, give you a scale of the the buildings in the geophysics. That's a modern building. Yeah. 
So if you go, if we loop over to that building, that's quite a sizable structure, and I'm sure you would agree. And some of the scales of these buildings are 10, 15, one of them is 25 metres in length. Okay, with, um, when I was teaching this on uh, Tuesday, I remember sitting down, we did, did a Skype class, and I shouted to Michelle, how long is our house? 15 metres. Well, if you sort of put another 10 metres onto it, this isn't the scale of these buildings. They're really big buildings. But when he's looking at this, he, he immediately knows that this is going to be Neolithic. To an archaeologist like me down here, I'd immediately presume something like that's got to be Roman, okay? Because that's, it, it's a linear wall. In, in, in a history, what we see is if it's, if it's, um, if it's a rectangular um, or maybe a square building, it's pre-Bronze Age. And if it's, um, or post-Iron Age, anything in that middle is circular. And he, he must have thought immediately that that building there has got to be Neolithic. It can't be Bronze Age. And look, look, at, look at that there. And, and then what he started to see was, was with the resistivity that we're using, the geofitters, typical time team, uh, there was loads of other buildings there. And he started to think, how, how extensive is this archaeology? How well preserved is this archaeology? Would it give us the answers to what's going on in Neolithic Orkney? Some of the missing answers. <coughs> so this is what we, we were thinking of. Um, and this, this is back in initial, initial work in two th 2002, then 2003. And then we come into the initial excavations. He's straight into the initial excavations. L luckily that Nick Card, Dr. Nick Card, is actually uh, the head of Orca, which is the um, archaeological institute, the one that does the excavation stuff. And my university is something completely different again. So we've got the archaeology unit and we've got the archaeology university. So he works for both, actually. Um, and then we start to get into the nitty-gritty. This stone here. This, this stone itself gives you an idea of scale. One foot, two foot, three foot, four foot, five foot, six foot, seven foot, eight foot long. Right, this stone. And it, when, when, this was, when this was initially found through ploughing, um, and, and actually, I'm going to <coughs> jump in here, the, the, the top soil, soil on this site isn't that deep, is about that deep. And the archaeology is by here. So any ploughing um, below that hits rock every time. And this stone had been lying, um, not on the horizontal, um, not as a vertical soldier, but um, on its vertical edge there. So this was actually poking out. They found this, and all these knobs here were actually due to plough damage. The plough was just going through it. <coughs> um, and they actually thought, right, this has got to be to do with a burial. It's got to be to do with a burial, 100%. Right? It's got to be. Um, but Nick Card was saying, oh, if it's to do with a burial, why do we have a, a thing that looks like a building there? Right, let's just try and work this out. But strangely enough, this would have been ploughed out at that time. The site now is a World Heritage, um, is a UNESCO <laughs> World Heritage site. It, it's, um, I, I've, been, I've been there with an archaeology company team. We stopped the vehicle and suddenly we've had a UNESCO van coming over. Oh, what are you guys doing here? We're an archaeology company. Oh, that's okay. That's fine. Yeah. Um, it's a well-protected site. Um, and this was another clue to what was going on here. This, this was actually part of a building. It's part of a building. Um, and that's, that's why it was placed in the ground in that way. So, um, so I'm going to do something that Cathy hates, because we're limited for time today. So to the area of 2.5 he hectares, there's, uh, there's 2.5 acres in a hectare, so you can, you can work out that it's quite a large area. Some anomalies indicative of a settlement, some believe it was uh, indicative of a burial site because they'd found this notched stone, this weird notched stone slab that was found, and it's down to plough damage. Um, and they started getting other archaeologists in from Glasgow, and then it re re realised that even though there could have been human remains lying around there, this was no kissed burial, this was part of a building. Th this, this stone had, had, had been lying... Because as you quarry it, quarry in the lids, and then you put it on its vertical, and this was part of one of the uh, key walls of a building. They had different different ways of building at the site. We'll, we'll have a look at that in a short while. 
Um, and, this, and they started realising quite soon that they, they were onto rectangular buildings, and these rectangular buildings were very similar to another site that had been excavated, a place called Barn House. Uh, some of the architectural features of those that have actually visited Scar um, Scarra Bray will we'll see that we'll see, see keen similarities. Most of what's going on in Orkney is happening 5,000 years ago, right? That was the best of the best, and then things started to get worse from that moment onwards. Um, until the point that we get into about 600 years AD, it's likely that nobody's living on Orkney at all. But that's a good debate. Um, but this one, one thing, I've got, I've got a very frustrating bloke who, who, who takes part in my Skype class, right? Um, and la the other week when we did Gobekli Tepe, he continually said, I don't believe any of this, right? I don't believe any of the dates. And last, uh, the other night, he was saying, I don't believe any of this. This can't be real. How is it we've got stuff going on in Orkney 6,000, 5,000 years ago when we've got nothing like it on the rest of Britain? It just can't be true. All the archaeological re results are faked. And I'm just going like this. Eh. Um, the fact of the matter is, the, the stuff has been so, they, they, they've examined it so thoroughly that they can't be wrong. It took them years for them to actually say what they had on Orkney because they thought the rest of Britain would say, oh, this can't be real. You can't have sites that are older than Stonehenge. You can't have the first stone circles. You can't have the first pottery. It just it doesn't happen like that. And slowly but surely, they, they, with the work on Orkney, they've been convincing people elsewhere that the, the stuff that they've got on Orkney, um, in lots of respects, is where civilization from the rest of Britain um, is actually developing from. So the way we, we start, what we do, we look at um, build this structure one. Um, and this structure one was discovered initially by um, a gradio gradiometry survey, geophys. And the results that something large and complex lay under the soil, so further investigations began from 2004, then onwards, year after year, they've been excavating, uh, and they've been finding more and more and more. They confirmed that much of the, uh, the mounded ridge on the southeastern end of the Ness is artificial, made up of structures and middens, all dating from the Neolithic period. Substantial archaeology. Uh, and when we look at this type of archaeology, remember the date, 2003, Godepi Tepe, 1995. These are sites that, that have been discovered in the past few decades. Some of the world's most major archaeology is being discovered now. Um, so that must mean that there is actually so much more out there to be discovered. Um, and watch this space. Go for it. Do these in the Neolithic and other things aren't appearing like this further south? Were they actually Norse people or, or from Norway or from well, well, we're just <coughs> Scottish? We'll, 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 do, we'll just do a, a quick, quick population <coughs> thing. Um, well, what, what's usually happening, um, the, the, the people living on Orkney uh, are, are part of the people um, that, that would have come in through waves of people from the continent. So what, what's happening about um, 10,000 years ago was the ice is, is really retreating. Um, people are actually following the retreating ice. And on that landscape, is very rich, and there's, there's grazing herds. And that takes you to Doggerland, the area between Europe and Britain. So those people are hunting. So as, as, as the land, it's, Orkney itself is still part of the mainland for a certain length of time. So people are heading all over the place. So eventually the people on Orkney get trapped, isolated. Um, but there's one weird little thing about this. Um, I don't know if you can remember about the, the voles, the vole story. They, they found some bones of voles on Orkney and the DNA was exactly the same DNA as to be found in the Netherlands post after Orkney became isolated. So strangely enough, there were still groups of people taking, taking the journey all the way from the Netherlands all the way up to Orkney um, and probably taking voles along with them for food or maybe they had pet voles or something. However, we had these voles. 
Do you, know, uh, do you know what the population would have been in say, Orkney at that time? Well, what, what's happening, there's, there's an archaeologist called Barry Cunliffe, and in the 1970s, Barry Cunliffe, from the number of burial chambers that we find, find on the island of Rousey, which Cathy's also been there with me, um, on the island of Rousey, what it is, is a fairly large island, one of, the, one of the big islands associated with Orkney. Um, and there, there, there's a burial chamber, and there's a sort of a settlement, and a burial chamber, and a settlement, a burial chamber, and a settlement, right? And what he did, he, was, he estimated from these settlements and the burial chambers how many people lived on Rousey. And then he used that pattern to say how many people lived on Orkney. But unfortunately, archaeologists have to say, hang on, if you've got this burial chamber, which we're actually not sure is a burial chamber now, it was used for something else, used there a different period of time, maybe these people moved around the island. The problem is is that we, we can't really get a grasp of human populations anywhere. Um, because from one minute to the next, so okay, let, let's talk about now today, right? Um, up until 10 years ago, uh, you had X amount of people living in Libya, okay? Um, say it was 20 million people in li li living in Libya. Um, 10 years later, there's, um, 18 million people living in Libya because they've gone all over Africa, <coughs> Europe, Asia, and all the rest of it. They've been displaced by the war, some have been killed, and so on. Um, unfortunately, that's only within 10 years. What archaeologists do, they put, they put basically the people over here, here, that lived at two different times together, and they try and work out the population. You just can't do it. Unfortunately, things move so quickly in archaeology that you have to be there in the minute to work out, do a census where people were, and it's impossible to do that in archaeology. What we do believe, however, the answer to the question is, is that it's likely that the population of Orkney was more substantial than it is today. And we'll leave it there. The population of Orkney today is about 20,000. It may have been about... <coughs> but when we talk about the history, we talk about the Neolithic, and it's, it's that big problem. Yeah, so... Um, it, at this stage in the Neolithic, it, it, the population was probably... Um, maybe about 10,000. By about um, the Iron Age, maybe about um, 30,000. Okay, today it's 20,000. So that's sort of, sort of what we're talking about. Um, interestingly enough, when they have cleared the soil off the site, you can see from that, from that guy's rump that mm. the topsoil isn't very deep. And what, what had been happening, I know this isn't a brilliant image, what had been happening is that the plow the plowing had over time started to take out some of these stones right so bit by bit maybe in a thousand years time what what's happening is the soil's being plowed and it's some of it's going in the lake either side plow lake or lock either side and slowly but surely there's going to be no more soil lot there the plowing has stopped at the side now um, and you can see there, what's happening is, is they're nicking a stone and they're bringing it up to the surface, like that big stone. Whatever plough they used that day to bring up the big stone, but how much of it was revealed. But what you've got, you've got this wonderful sharp archaeology that we see represented in something like Scala Brig. When you look down at the archaeology of Scala Brig, it's angular. Okay? You might have a circular sort of backdrop to it, like the skin around the outside, but the elements inside are, are linear, are angular. Okay? Uh, with the odd circular niche and stuff. So this is what they're seeing, and suddenly he's thinking, right, what we've got is something like um, a scarabray. Um, and this, this is, and, but he, he was thinking, right, surely to God, the, ar the archaeology here is only about that deep, not a metre and a half in depth, as they actually eventually found out. There's actually still going down. The problem is with archaeology is archaeology is just very, very destructive. Um, so, say for example, you, you have the roof tiles here, right? To get to the floor layer, you've got to remove that. I know that sounds obvious, but when you're removing this, this layer, layer of stones here, you've got to record it thoroughly, you've got to stack these somewhere else, and you've got to get to the next layer. And there's a certain point where you've got to stop as archaeologists, because if you keep digging and digging, the walls are going to start to cave in. So you've got all these different problems. Lots of times in archaeology, I go onto an archaeological site and, and, and I get the question, um, what is actually under here? Why do we know what's under here? Um, and it, it's, the same as, it's the same as Norman Castles. Let's, let's, let's beat this one. It's the same as Norman Castles. Most Norman Castles in, in, in this, this wonderful land of ours actually has a native castle underneath it. But because the floor level's intact, 
They don't want to go any deeper. They want to. It's not a political thing, honestly. Our closures are doing the right thing, and they don't want to go any deeper because they would destroy the Norman stuff to get to the native stuff, you know. Um, so that's basically the theory. But to get more answers, we do have to take one or two risks uh, with the archaeology um, at the mess. Um, and that is one of the aerial views of this site. So what we do, we actually come onto a plan, and each of these are numbered um, 1 to 14. Um, there's a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 buildings, and they're lit numbered 1 to 14. And the reason why that is, is that the, as they plotted the landscape, they said, right, we've got building one year, we've got building two here, they haven't actually excavated building two. It's called um, context archaeology. So when, when everything for building one has a context of 001, then, then you have another number alongside it. So that, that would work continuously across the site. So we just just glancingly looking at this, and I know Chris with a wonderful eyesight at the back, because you did have wonderful, you do have wonderful eyesight, don't you, Chris? Because you're a librarian. There you go. Um, yeah, as you can see, there's like a pinky orangey like colour down there. Um, and that helps us to what they're burning inside this building. What comes out pinky orangey is peat. We know that peat gives that signature. What comes out black and whatever, we know that they're burning uh, wood, for example. Um, and you can work out all these signatures across the site. And we can work out maybe what the temperatures of the rooms were and what exactly was going on in these buildings. Um, so, and uh, by the way, if anyone ever is going to Orkney, let me know. And uh, if you're going at the right time of year, we'll, we'll try and um, get um, Sean out to um, take you around the site. He's a photographer there. Um, so all this information here, right, um, at its zenith, at its high point, um, or you could, at, at its main start point, its, its high point, it, different ways of interpreting that word, the site itself, 3,100 years BC, that, that's when most of the buildings are sort of being occupied at the site. Um, they're do dominated by huge freestanding buildings enclosed by a massive stone wall. Right? Are we talking completely dry stone walls? Uh, no, no. Because what's happening, um, anyone, who's, anyone who's done building in this country will know that if you, if you get a stone and you put a bit of clay on top and you keep that clay da dry, that, that, those two stones will be, be really well connected together, really bonded together. As long as you keep that clay dry, it, it, it's a good mortar. Just raw clay is a good mortar. And we know that. And how do we know that? Because if any of you go down to Wiltshire, I don't know if any of you have gone down to Wiltshire and gone up to Avebury via the South Road. And be, when you go to the South Road, uh, the West, West Kennet um, Avenue, um, the Kennet Avenue, you, on the left there's this, there's this cob wall, beautiful cob wall. And if you look at the date of that cob wall, you work out that the date of that cob wall is about 600 years old. And it's made of mud. But because there's a thatch on it, that wall's still there today. Right, so as long as you keep clay and mud dry, it's perfect. It's, a, it, it's perfect material to bond stones together. Um, and so you've got these freestanding walls, right, with, with clay bonded it all together. And as long as it's kept dry, it's a really good material to build with. Um, so is, is this, um, what is this site about? Is, is it a settlement? I've heard it described as a large site of temples. Um, religious site, um, all these different things. Maybe a shopping mall in the Neolithic period. But the information that we get from the site is, is equally more than the interpretation, if that makes sense. So, okay, that building could be X, Y, and Z. But that building's full of pottery, it's full of tile, it's full of decorated stuff. Um, we've got evidence of tiled roofs answering one of the questions, what's going on in Orkney? what they're putting on their roofs, answering also that there must have been substantial timbers out there because the weight of these roofs was substantial. And we know it was substantial because the walls would subside. The weight of the stone, supported by very hefty timber, made the walls subside. Not because underneath the walls there was mud, um, simply because no matter what you've got underneath, if you've got substantial weight on top, the whole thing will subside. Um, 
So Keller dwarfs, 800 plus examples of decorated stone, even those weird, <coughs> lovely, circular stones that we don't know what they are, okay? We found a few of them there as well. One or two bits of human bone, again, one or two bits, not enough to put you together again, Keith. Um, and lots of cattle bone as well. They, uh, we get, and the thing is, if we don't get through this today, don't worry about it. We're going to be doing it in a couple of weeks, again, you know, the rest of it again as well. So I'm not really bothered about whether we get through it or not today. Um, and archaeology suggests uh, that they were feasting and exchanging ideas and objects, i.e. the shopping mall thing. Feasting, um, is it a site of um, rituals, celebrations, political, celestial events? But it's part of a vibrant society. We'll all agree with that. This is part of a, a moment in time where human beings say, hey, boys, we're here. Hey, girls, this is what we're about. Um, and this is what this site is about at the same time. So, so this is really, really going to impress Ellen. It's all about Ellen these days, not Kathy. You know, Ellen's, Ellen's taken over from Kathy these days. Um, so uh, what we're going to do, um, we've got a plan. Ellen loves her plans. And, um, and this is the road here. Um, and that's the spoil heap. And I know Cathy's been around this site with me. Um, and this here is structure one. And we're going to look at structure one. You know where structure one is? It, it's associated with all these buildings. Um, so there is structure one. So that's the first one we're going to look at. And zoom in on structure one. That's a beautiful plan, isn't it? And uh, surely you can all see it. Structure one is a beautiful plan. And it, it shows many innovations in the Neolithic period. Let, let's list them. Room divisions. Area divisions. Uh, the idea of a controlled entranceway. So you come in here, you've got to go this way to go this way. Uh, the idea of... Um, the sense that they may have had damp courses, i.e. here. Um, the walls were highly insulated. Um, another innovation as well, drainage. Drainage coming in, slabbed drainage. So the sewage can just go away from the buildings, indicating that you, you've probably got indoor toilets as well. Don't we see at Scarabray? Is this 3,000 years ago? This is 5,000 years ago. Yeah. 3,000 years BC. This is an innovation. This is an innovation 2,000 years ago. Get over it. This is 5,000 years ago. Okay? In, the, in the medieval period, without being crude, they were chucking their doings out of windows. Okay? There was no drainage in most medieval towns. That's 600 years ago. This is six to 5,000 years ago. Add an all on that. Um, and what we've, what we've got, we've got um, these little things here are probably lined with clay, and these are keeping um, oysters and various other things alive, fish alive, in these fish pots, which we see again at Scarabray. Um, insulated floors. Um, a, a certain blue um, um, maritime clay, okay? <coughs> like a clay that we see at Scarabray. We see it within a lot of buildings across um, Orkney throughout the ages. And this is a damp course. This, this is... This, this is to stop the moisture coming up. This, this is, um, so cavity walling, damp coursing. This is, this is, these are all innovations. These are all developed innovations. Um, and and what, what, else, what else have we got there? We, we've got the build, these buildings themselves, two or three metres in height. Two or three metres in height. Let me think about that, right? Most buildings back then were, were really sort of, subterranean, they, they weren't, weren't much off the ground, okay? So you're going over there, you're seeing a building sort of, which, which sort of ranges in height to the level of this, and they, these would be some of the, the, the tallest human structures that, that you could ever imagine back in the day, okay? We're not saying that they had another story on top, that's still up for debate, because if they had other stories on top, you can imagine the stone that would have been required to build um, such a site at the Ness. Um, the other thing that the other thing as well is 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 that they they've got um, ample amounts of stone. And the re 
reason why the, the, the archaeology is so well preserved at this site is that when it was abandoned, they thought, hey, Chabella, Bellissimo, let's go somewhere else and let's, um, there's so much stone, we'll just use that stone and just build. Right, we just ignore this site, forget about it. Our ancestors live there today. We do exactly the same today. We demolish buildings, we take all that stuff away, dump it in a hole somewhere, and we don't reuse any of the material, and we just get new materials in and build with it. The Neolithic people on Orkney were doing exactly the same thing, except obviously timber would have got scarcer and scarcer. Um, the other thing about this building is that what we have, it is built in stages, so We've got a rectangular building to start off with, all the way there. Um, and then what they've done, right, we've got a bit of subsidence. So what we'll do, we'll put, a, we'll have a division in here, we'll divide it. Okay, we've got this bit of a curved wall. Okay, we'll have a bit of a cavity in there as well. So we'll do that. Um, and the other, the other structural innovation is also the word bay. Um, you've got one bay there around a half, you've got another bay there around a half, and another bill bay uh, here around a half, and sort of outer areas. So these are all architectural terms and um, perspectives that you'd actually come across today. You build in the sense of a bay, this should actually be one bay, two bay. Okay, this is what this, this, this is when we're looking at bays. So when you've got a window, or a sort of niche, or an area, or beam cord across that's classed as a bay. Isn't that right, Peter? Mm -hmm. well, by the way, I, I was um, I was proofing your 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 friend's story yesterday, and um, Kelvin Dark. God rot him. Uh, so structure one was the first of the buildings on the nest to be discovered naturally, because it's building number one, um, and is perhaps the first built, or maybe it isn't. I don't know. Uh, while it, like the others, was built on top of earlier buildings, so there's more under it. So what you're seeing is more under it. Um, so people have been living there for like 6,000 years. More than five. Uh, the building has a complex history and survives as you see it in its second phase today. What you see today is, 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 is the second phase, not the earlier stuff. The problem, the, arche the archaeologist has the problem. To actually find out more, you basically have to destroy that building. And I think he's like, no, let's just... We're okay with what we've got. It's, it's old enough. You know, let's not be too greedy. They can get, the, uh, get that other information somewhere else anyway. Originally, originally the building that we saw was, um, was 15 metres in length. Okay? 15 metres. To give you an idea of 15 metres, okay, that's one, two, three, four, for the sake of argument, five metres. 15 metres. So it's three of these in width. Is that impressive? I think it is. Um, because its remodeling was not uh, necessitated uh, by subsidence or slumping walls. So basically, they, they, they dealt with the subsidence before it, it, it got any worse, before the weights there um, made the building subside in the first place. So it's got function, uh, it's, it's got obviously an entranceway, it's got new entranceways. Within these buildings, what you usually got, you've got one entranceway. Um, you've got one entrance way. And the reason why you've got one entrance way is all to do with heat. So, say for example, if I, if I come into this room now, okay, here we go. come into this room, and you've got another doorway over there, um, there's going to be a bit of a sort of vacuum, and all the hot air is going out, and the hot air is just going to die out straight away. Uh, the, 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 uh, the doorway, the threshold of the doorways as well, you, you have to have stooped as you actually come in, because what when you actually do come in, the, the heat itself is, is hovering above this lintel. So it's hovering, and the heat's not going to exit because there's no other exit. This is the only doorway, right? That's it. And there's no windows in there at all. And there's also no flues in the roof. Um, it exits through the roof itself. We, do, we did have one innovation, and, and um, where there was one in innovation in um, Orkney, uh, not Orkney, Shetland. There was a building in Shetland um, called... Um, Oh, God, I did, did part of my master's degree on it. Um, there's a building in, in Shetland, and, um, and they, they actually had a flue that was actually from ground level going out. So it's almost as if uh, the, 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 um, any excess smoking would actually go from ground level out, which is quite strange. Um, or it could have been to do with something else entirely. So they just had a hole in the roof that they to let the smoke out? No, no hole. So it just... But, yeah, I think that's right. Um, that's the, why it becomes orange. 
Um, um, Donald Trump. Um, the song I was thinking about in, in Shetland was Scatness. That's the, that's the one. No, what basically what it what it is what it is um, within a building like this, within a building like this, what what what's got to happen is is that the heat needs to be retained in a building, right? And if if you've got any kind of flu, it's gonna the heat's just gonna go out. There's just no point heat in the building. There's no point at all. And the other thing as well is if you you know. If you're allowed, if you can um, keep the heat in the room, you have to burn less because a fire is always driven um, by the temperature in the room. So, so what's happening is that th this, as you come into the room, you sort of got this warm layer above the lintel, and then you've got a smoke layer, and the smoke layer is like whispery and so on. But slowly but surely, that smoke is actually exiting through the roof. If you've got any circulation of air, the whole room will be completely smoky. You get free smoke food as well, and it can kill <laughs> Exactly. Smoke, smoke, you've got your smoke mackerel, your smoke bass, <laughs> up in the gods <laughs> there. Is it a conical roof or a flat roof? Or a roof is it? The roof's still, but it's flat, isn't it? Ah, uh, no, it's not flat. It, it, it's it's um, it's a gable roof. They're going to be. We, we think they're going to be gable. We, they, the thing is, if you have sloping this way, then the elements are going to get in by here. So you're going to have to have a gable of some kind going all the way. You're going to have to have some kind of ridge, and this is what we're seeing. So that would have taken substantial weight. Uh, but that it's uh, the other thing as well is look, we're finding the thing. Hang on, what's he on about? If you do it, and, and then if you do something like that. Um, the heat's going to exit through the tiles. We've got evidence that at the underskin of the tiles was lined. Everything was um, um, everything was sealed in. On the underside, everything was sealed. Because what we've got, we've got evidence of some kind of liney clay material on the inside. Um, it's um, called um, calkin, or is it chalkin, or whatever, whatever no, that word. Calkin, yeah. On boats. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. So calkin. So so that's all calked on the inside. So nothing can escape. Um, it's it's quite a strange it's quite a strange way of doing things because the technology should tell us that the, the smoke should exit through a thatched roof. But when you've got a slab roof, there must be some innovation that we don't know about. The fact of the matter is they were able to keep those those rooms insulated and they were able to keep the heat in. They must have burned very s small amounts of fuel because fuel fuels not easy to come by. Peat, right? presumably, is it? If you if you're stripping peat, peat's going to run out as well. Um, peat wants to run out of the room and have a fag. But the other one upside would have got him too. There is a yeah. few, few questions. Just, there is a lot of questions. Well. To, to be honest with you, Pete, and all of you in the room, there are lots of questions that we have not answered at this minute. Right? I'm just projecting some theories. So chalking of the chalking of the walls, uh, the the the, um, the slates inside, the slabs inside. That's what we've got. That there's no sense of a flu anywhere, um, and the other thing is we the, the other thing what we do find is there's no there's no um, there's no soot on the soot on the tiles at all, not a, not any evidence of soot on the tiles at all. So that means again that they were lined. They may have been lined. They they, they may have actually been multi-layer lined. They may have been lined on the inside. They may have had battens, and there may have been a layer. Of thatch on the inside, so that would have absorbed all the smoke and it would gradually come out. That would have made more sense. That makes more sense that it's actually lined with something um, other um, than the um, clay and the lime. So let's again move on. Um, Heather was used in early Welsh houses. And I, I think we've got examples of that at St. Fagans as well. Um, what what we what we've got as well from the from the image that we've seen earlier on, um, they they they've excavated further down and and this this is this is as the image was before they excavated further down. So you can so you, so you can oh hang on, no, it's the other way around. This is actually this is actually the lowest layer of the building. Sorry about that. So this is 50, this is fifteen meters in length, um, and what you've got you've got one bay, two bay, three bays. As I said. Uh, because the other image that we've seen is as the building's still being excavated. Um, 
So what we've got, we've got this here, we've got this half and this half, and probably another half over here. <coughs> and what we've got is indications of the material that they're burning. By the orangey, um, by the orangey pinky colour of that, that indicates clearly that they're burning peat. Peat is peat isn't a great material to burn if you're not that good efficient at understanding how peat burns. And what I mean by that is if, you, if you're aware that the heat's going to remain in the building, you only have to burn small amounts of peat. And also, peat gives off um, very low levels of heat. So the peat gives off about 200 degrees, 300 degrees C in temperature, which, which may sound a lot, um, but that's only 100, 150 degrees above boiling point. And that's not really going to heat a room if the heat is exiting out of, the, out of the rooms in the first place. So they're burning small amounts of peat and that's ticking the building over. The best way to keep a building warm is to keep the um, home fires burning. And as we're all told <coughs> by British Gas, we're supposed to keep our central heating on 24-7, 365 days of the year. And the reason why they say that is based on this earlier technology except our homes are nothing like this earlier technology. Michelle and I live in a house which is so cold in the winter, no matter how much you heat it, it just doesn't remain in. The equivalent in the uh, prehistoric period, that building would have been warm all days of the year, with small amounts of peat being burnt. But there's, there's, a, there's also a yellow stain in here as well. Um, is, is that burning some other material? Is that burning... Um, something like uh, charcoal, or is that burning timber, given that colour? It's very difficult to say at this stage. Um, what, I'm gonna try, what I'm gonna do is, we're gonna go on to another building, a uh, structure eight. There's no text associated with that one. Uh, and this is structure eight. So what, what we have with these buildings, um, undoubtedly rectangular, and there's, there's signs of subsidence here. And you can, see, you can see it's all sort of higgledy-piggledy. Um, and this building here is a very important building <coughs> to go on to. Um, th this, this building isn't 15 metres in length. This is 25 metres in length. This is a huge structure, this one up here. So this is built directly on top of this. One, but what we do see is another innovation. Slabs on the floor. These aren't roof tiles. These are slabs set into the floor. And why is that an innovation? Because in the Bronze Age and in, a, in the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, um, we do see floors mainly across Britain as being threshed, beaten, beaten floors, clay floors. Okay, heavy clay floors. Uh, hopefully dry in the winter months, but definitely dry in the summer. But very dusty at the same time. But when you walk into a room, like a carpet, your feet feel warm. You've got a warm effect on your feet because you're walking on clay. You know, it's, it, it, it almost keeps the, the heat. But these slabs don't. And why they've got slab floors must be a structural reason. Uh, because as I was writing in my, um, in my uh, thesis, I was writing that uh, uh, before the Romans, you have... Uh, you have warm floors, and in the Roman world you have cold floors, unless they're heated. The, the Roman world is a true world of contrast. One minute you can have a floor that's really hot to the touch, and the next minute it's freezing cold. When you have a beaten floor, it's practically the same temperature all year round, and you, we would all prefer a carpet than we were a slab floor. Uh, but I'm sure you'd disagree with that, wouldn't you, Michelle? Um... One, two, three hearths, three bays, and actually a fourth bay over here. But again, this building is more substantial. And what I'd like to do is we will take a break there. We'll take a shorter break. Um, and and um, we'll take a shorter break. Um, are there any questions? What was the climate like then? Would have been warmer. The, the temperature would have been warmer. Some believe up to two degrees warmer than it is today. They say if our temperature on the planet raised by half a degree, London would be underwater. Um, so two degrees 
warmer than it is today, but water levels hadn't recovered since the ice age, so obviously water levels are still rising, mm. okay, because the ice caps are still melting substantially. Right, uh, we're going to take a break now. If there's no more questions, anyone want any eggs? Can I have eggs? Um, anyone got any questions? Colchester money or whatever, and we'll go from there. Thank you very much. Right, so here we go. Is it? It's not gone all cool now, has it? So the, the next building we're going to look at is Building 10. There it is. A Building 10 is a fascinating building. Not because it's Building 10. Do, do, do. But Building 10 itself, as you can see, is a huge structure. This is 25 metres long. I know we say sizes and everything, but in this case, it is. So there it, there it is in association with, association with the other buildings. One and eight that we've got from Building 10. Let's look at that, this one. And this is exceedingly fascinating. Um, so there we go. So what, what we find here, they haven't excavated it all yet because they've still got a way to go. But one thing that we can see is a paved walkway leading to the site. So again, the idea of paved walkway 5,000 years ago, that innovation that I mentioned earlier on. This building itself has several skins of walls. Uh, you've got a very large outer skin here with a cavity wall here. Um, and then you've got another wall um, and you've got all these sort of arrangements associated with a building of this size. Now, this is, this, this, this is a building some archaeologists have said is actually a temple structure, part of a temple complex. And you can actually see how close the archaeology is to the surface. Look at that there. There's, there's basically millimetres between the archaeology and the surface itself. So it's very... It's, <laughs> Very well fitting that uh, the archaeologist, Dr. Nick Carr, personal friend of Cathy, uh, decided to excavate this site. Um, moving on again. Um, so, what a statement to make. Built around 3000 BC, 5000 years ago, Structure 10 was the major, last major construction on site. Due to its structural instability, it was remodelled perhaps a hundred years later, at which point a human arm bone and carved stone ball was deposited inside. Whatever that means, but we haven't found many human bones at the Nessa Vodka. After it was abandoned, a huge feast was held around 2,450 years BC, 1215, um, when hundreds of cattle were slaughtered and consumed, um, and the bones were placed in the buildings surrounded passageway. And what we mean by that is when they've been placed in the passageway, the building can no longer be used. Um, what we do actually see similar evidence to do with the site of Scara Bay. For example, beads placed in a passageway at Scara Bay, a Scara Bay indicating uh, that that was a votive um, sort of closing of the building. But maybe it could mean something else. Oh, I'm just using the other interpretation. You know what I'm trying to do, Cathy? Trying to make this alive. Um, so. In 2008, the excavators uncovered one of the, one of the largest, if not the largest, stone-built Neolithic non-funerary structure in Britain. It's the most important find ever. Actually, you know, I, I, I use that a lot. But in fact, if anyone ever asked me what the most important discovery ever was in British archaeology, uh, the site at the Ness of Vodka would actually be in the top two, if not the top one itself. But because I'm very much in love with the Romans, um, Binchester is actually at the top of the list. Yeah. Um, going by the name of Structure 10, the first hint of the building came from geophysical scans, but it wasn't excavated until much later. 25 metre long structure. Huge structure indeed. So we've got the width of this building 5 metres wide. Okay, actually this is under 5 metres wide. So this is 5 times the, the width of this room. So you can imagine, this is a substantially long structure. Uh, long, basically the length of this very um, town hall that we're in today. Uh, 19 metres wide, and, and walls that were, were up to 4 metres thick. The outer walls were 4 metres thick. And the remaining height of the wall itself is still a metre in height. So this is substantial archaeology that survived ploughing and all the other things that have been thrown at it over the years. 
Um, this is truly like nothing else found on Orkney. Up until this point, the biggest things on Orkney were thought to be the chamber, the burial chambers, or the non-burial chambers, and the standing stone sites, or whatever you want to call them. But now we're starting to get an idea that what's up the mess is revolutionary. Um, again, looking at some more of the details, outside the building itself, uh, you've got a paved passageway, um, and you've got um, this, this walkway, again, that sense of a passageway. We talked about it in the break. Cathy said about having a cold surface in a house where she used to live. Is that correct, Cathy? Uh, but back then, it was the type of thing that they did. Um, the, 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 and what we do find is that we believe that lots of the structures um, and the niches were very similar to the niches that were excavated by Gordon Child uh, in the um, late 1920s and the early 1930s at Scarabray. So the, the timeline, the, what they're seeing at Scarabray and what we're seeing at the Ness is a very similar events, very similar things. They may be uh, decades apart, and these are different people. And what you've got, you've got freestanding, incorporating this striking red and yellow sandstone. Again, the colour of the stone uh, is, is very important to these people. Somebody asked me uh, the other day, where are they quarrying the stone from? I'm simply saying they're quarrying the stone uh, from as nearby as possible. That's where most of the stone buildings uh, in Orkney are getting their material from. The craftsmanship, the interior stonework of structure 10 compares starkly with the scrappy central chamber stonework. So what we're talking about, there's, there's different, they've got different ways of building, different standards of building, but having different meanings maybe. But back to this last sentence here, standing here today, looking at these remains and the sheer scale and complexity of the architecture, it's an awe-inspiring sight for the archaeologist Nick Carr. So the measurements you're giving me, the external ones. The external so measurements, yeah. By the time you're saying four metres off for both walls. Yeah, four metres off for the both walls. Plus the gap. Eight take away 25. Okay, ten take away 25. It's still it's a 15 metre long building inside. So whatever way you look at it, and to be honest with you, Cathy, we'll look at it this way. No, I'm not trying to do it down. I find no, it, it is. <coughs> the walls in this build are about a metre thick. You know, lots of castles, one to two metres thick, you know. Um, and you take them in. But, but again, the masonry, the length, the, the material used. Think of the material being used in the construction of these buildings. And then after their, after their life is over, it's almost as if we'll, we'll just move on to something else because there's so much material in all clear. It's like our modern-day wasteful society. What they're saying is that Look at the way this is constructed, and then later on they've got a little bit of poorer construction on the inside. But again, this is whatever you're looking at, and the, and the way this actually comes together um, is awe inspiring. That's, that's what Nick Card is coming to. It's uh, a very point, though, because I got my roots reduced because they were basing side measurements on the outside measurements, whereas the ones are safe fit the inside measurements on the inside. <laughs> again, across, across, across the site. Across the site, you've got different ways of building. Bu building 12, for example, over there. Um, if we look at building 12, we can see that over time, a building 12 had problems of subsidence. And the problem, we've, we've got to go to the roofing material anyway before we end today. But what you've got here, you've got subsidence again with the weight of the roof. Um, because you've got this, th these wonderful ornate walls to start off with. Well, well, look, look, at, look at the way that's created. So if you look at something like Scarabray, you might have shelving in there, or you might have individual stalls or niches. You might have shelving there. You might have stalls there for animals or people to sleep in. Each of these bays has a half. Uh, and, but eventually, they're thinking the, the weight of what's above is, is causing subsidence. You've actually had to thicken the walls. You have, you've had to add strength to it. This, this is an age-old tradition. We see, we, see it, we see it throughout history with Roman sites. Hadrian's Wall itself, in parts of Hadrian's Wall, they've actually, they've actually widened it um, because the weight of the masonry has been subsidence. They've had to wi widen it. They do that with castles as well, where you actually where you put butts. And, and, and they, this is a technology that's been with us many, many years. And it all goes back to sites such as this. And maybe internal buttresses? Um, and those internal buttresses are actually, we do believe that they're actually for support as well. So you're going to need that extra support. <coughs> Again, 
even with the internal buttresses, that's not enough to support the roof. So we've got all those different things. So this building um, features exquisite carved and dressed stone in its construction. Must have been a stunning sight in its heyday. Uh, and obviously what you've got requiring major work to remedy the problems. And you've got the stone piers that you've mentioned. You've got the hearths themselves. Um, and you've got other bits added to the building. And you've got pottery. Uh, what we've got, we've got crushed and broken remains of huge pots, including a style of groupware not encountered before. These huge pots themselves are so big that they were probably created in situ and then left in the corner of the room because they couldn't be moved. Uh, and, and because of the temperature of, 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 the, of the room itself, they gradually dried out. Um, and they were used to store grain, and then eventually <coughs> they just collapsed. Uh, this is what we're seeing with lots of the pottery. I'm with Kath Kathy for the first time. I don't, want to go on, I don't want to go on about this a lot, but first thing that um, one of the first things that me and Kathy saw on Orkney was, was a tray of this pottery. It was a really thick pottery <coughs> with walls that thick, um, and, and there was a reconstruction. You remember the big reconstruction of the pot there? Yeah, there was a huge reconstruction of the pot. It was so big, you're thinking that's no way they could have moved that. It was just built there, and, and, and you find all these little nuggets of information as you go across the site. And as I say, um, I'm not going to rush any of this because we will be revisiting this. Um, and other, bit, other bits of the structure, but another fascinating thing with this. What we've had, um, it's almost as if they thought, right, structurally, we'll give up on laying slabs of stone on the horizontal. What we'll do, we'll have slabs of stone on the vertical and just fill them in. And then that, that'll, uh, take the, that'll take the, the structural weight. This is what we're seeing here. Um, and you can see that there. That's where it's lined there. Because that, that's going to give you a bit of the thickness of the wall. Um, and you've got this idea that we see, for example, in the Neolithic period. And to use upright stones like this, you can see that's on the outside. It's an upright stone there. Is structurally bearing, it can support weight. We see, we see this innovation, we thought, at uh, places um, like um, the Broch of Burze or, or the Broch of Gurnus. And at the Broch of Gurnus, what they use, they use lengths of stone, not on the horizontal, but lengths of stone on the vertical. This is, but we thought that was invented in about 400 years AD. No, it was invented 5,000 years ago. They, they knew how to build, they, they knew what to do, they, 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 they knew the stresses and strains the stone could take. Um, again, well, what we've got here, we'll move on away from that, and you can see what we're going, what we're doing there. These are placed so they're actually load bearing. And what I'm going to do is not rush over this, we'll come back to this again. And look at that there. Just wanted to probably do this bit today um, to sort of close with. One of the painted stones found on the site. Painted stone from 5,000 years ago. Um, some say this was the, the, way, the way we see the painted stones. Maybe they were painted in some areas and they weren't painted in others. Other archaeologists argue that you have the odd stone that was shown, but the rest of the walls were rendered in the inside. We know that the walls were rendered on the inside. To actually have paint on the stonework initially is very confusing. To have paint on the stonework initially, and then you're covering up with render, is very strange. Maybe there was a bit of stone that was exposed. What we're seeing with the evidence of the site is, is, is not all of the stones are actually painted. <coughs> Painted walls. It was something that has been speculated on for decades. But the Nessa Brodka in 2010, what you have is the painted walls. Five days into the season in 2010, uh, there was uh, clear sections of walling within two structures that had been painted. So these ain't boring, you know, um, low, low of the mill buildings. You, 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 you go into these buildings relatively dark, so there would have been forms of lighting. They would have had uh, um, lamps, which were made of um, the vertebra bones of whales, for example. Again, I, I've seen, you remember the, the, the lantern that was made out of vertebra bone of the whale in the laboratory, Kathy? 
oh, come on, your memory should be better than this. <laughs> but any, anyway, <laughs> and, and what we, we know that they, we know they were being used for oil because they, there was residue of oil in them, so they actually had land. So they'd be able to look at these walls, they'd be able to understand these walls. So they thought this was absolutely amazing when they were actually finding this. Um, and this is the this is the archaeologist Nick Card speaking. But rather than breaking out the Stone Age equivalent of a sheepskin roller to jazz up some interior walling, a president would appear that the decoration was applied to specific singular stones, as I mentioned. The archaeologist Nick Card, we have discovered stonework within uh, structures one and eight that has been decorated and enhanced with extensive layers of pigment. On one stone, although no coherent pattern can be discerned, there are several different uh, colours covering most of the stone surface. Reddish browns, yellows and oranges, while on another stone, the whole face seems to have the same reddish colour applied right across its surface. And you see this on the continent, but up until now, not really in our country, because it just erodes away. And he says that... Um, what the materials they're using, um, what do the, these discoveries do, um, is bring these beliefs into sharp um, contrast, what, what, what they actually believed and what they thought. Multi, mul the, it was a multicoloured world within the Neolithic. So whenever we see these programmes on TV, and it's a really drab world with people wandering around, bare skins, you know, living on the edge of society, it's nothing like that at all. It's illuminating. It, it's, it's, a, it's a new age. And if you've got these buildings in the first place, why not decorate them? Um, a single piece of hematite, for example, can produce several different colours mixed with animal fat, milk, or egg white. It produces a sticky paste-like paint. So hematite not being used for iron products, but being used for paint. Hematite can be applied directly to the <coughs> stone surface with a little bit of water. <coughs> Interestingly enough, uh, this has... Uh, remained in the place of time. You can still see it. It's still there today. Um, I'm going to probably, what I'm going to do is we're going to end on roofing tiles today and we will come back to the rim of Ring of Brodka. Anything that we haven't come across, we, we will look at. Now, there are indications that there are holes in some of these. There are indications that there are no holes in some of them. Um, the effect that that would have, you'd, have, you'd need battening underneath, and you'd need battening on the surface. So without the ones with dowels on, either you could actually support these on the roofs with, with dowels, as you've got on the diagon diagonal, you could have the dowel going <coughs> from the wood into the wood underneath, and not having to need a hole into the tiles themselves. There's different ways of roofing. But with, that, with those methods, without having to dowel it directly into the roof, and without using battening to keep it on the roof, you would have needed some, some, some kind of render on the outside to keep the slabs down. So this is what we're actually finding at the site. We've got a tiny little bit of a description. And amazingly enough, we'll have done two hours today, and we're finishing at a reasonable time. Um, Neil, if, if you've not come early, you'd have had the whole lecture. Oh, there you are, you see, every oh. week. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I think I thought you. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's Michelle, she's got the man's on me in the morning. She expects me to make her breakfast, tea in bed. I, don't believe you. <laughs> I wouldn't believe me either. Um, in the years since Scarabre re emerged from the sand, one of the most commonly asked questions has been how were these Neolithic structures roofed? And we'll start with it when we come to the Ness Brodga again. Yeah, with the got, roofing. You've only got one minute, you don't want to be late. Two minutes left. Two minutes left. Uh, because nothing survived on Scarabray's uh, <coughs> roof structures, we must assume that they were, they were made of perishable or organic materials, whalebone or driftwood, beams supporting a roof of turf skins, thatch, seaweed or straw. But, but, but out on the Nesabrod, the, the, the archaeologists found Orkney's first real evidence of a Neolithic roof. In most reconstructions of prehistoric buildings, you'll see often <coughs> hodgepodge arrangements of turf, animal skins, or perhaps thatch. But at the Ness, the Neolithic builders used stone slabs for at least one of their buildings, if not two, and many others, because we've only excavated a few, a few buildings, the remains of which have been uncovered within the side recesses along the interior walls of structure eight. And there we go, there it is for all to see. What we're going to do, without taking the glory away from this image, 
Are there any questions? What are the cladding of those tiles for? It, it, it's... Well, what? it's slate, anyway. No, it's not slate. It, it, it's, it's sandstone. This is sandstone. Um, obviously, um, using the vernacular with the wood stain tiles, it's, it's, it's sandstone. The, uh, basically, what you've got, you've got beds of sandstone on the vertical, right? You do have sandstone on the horizontal in places, but this is on the vertical. And, and it, it fractures easy if you put leverage underneath it. Um, and they're just getting these lids of things up, working them, and then moving on to site. And that's simply what they're doing. Um, they're, they're, they are, they're roughly cut lots of these. And when we look at this in a, in a couple of weeks, you'll see the roughly cut nature. So what we're going to do, we're going to be looking at the archaeology yeah. of Binchester next week. Um, I'll have a quick chat with you two before you leave. If there's no more questions, have you all enjoyed today? I pay him to say that. Go on, ask him a few questions. Bingo, like we, exactly, like my dad used to. Um, I'll see you all week, next week, everybody coming next week? So hopefully if we do start late, it'll be better for you. <laughs> Can you yeah. bang down the top, please? Yeah. Actually, to be honest with you, it's really cold in here. It's so awful, they have to drink it. Really appreciate it. Well, that.